so we're going to be off to a little bit of a slow start because I think it's hard to get people inside on such a beautiful day, but um, I welcome all you stalwarts who um, um, decided to pass up the next two hours outside and come in for what we hope is going to be a really stimulating discussion. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, and then I'm going to open it up um, to our speakers and panelists. Um, I'm Steve Handelman. I'm the director of the Center on Media, Crime, and Justice at John Jay. Um, and I'm also editor of the Crime Report. Um, as you can tell from your program, this is a co-hosted event. Our partners for this one were uh, really deeply honored is City Limits Magazine. And the idea behind this forum was not to have, and I should say this at the start, is not to have a debate about gun control. Not that it's not important or not necessary, but this is not intended to be the place for that. What it is, as the um, title of the program says, is really to look at New Yorkers under the gun. That may be a little bit dramatic, but the point of it is that we're in a huge environment of pros and cons about gun control, gun laws, and gun legislation. And wherever it comes out, um, New Yorkers are vulnerable or affected by how the debate goes either uh, nationally in Washington, in other states, and certainly here in the city and, and the state. So what we've done is we've split it up, split the discussion up into two panels. Um, Inevitably, the topics we're going to discuss are going to blend a bit. But the first panel is really to look at the at the general landscape of legislation, both at the, I'm sure those of you who've been following the issue have seen all the stuff that's been happening um, over the past several weeks and several months. Uh, so we want to look at how um, the different pieces of legislation, the different ideas uh, affect and or will affect New Yorkers themselves. And the second panel, we're going to just drill down a little deeper into what happens when uh, inevitably gun violence does happen in the city. Um, how do you stop it? How do you intervene? Um, what are the different ways and innovative practices that are underway in the city for any kind of tragic event? Um, national attention, quite rightly, has lately been on school shootings and mass shootings, um, but as I don't need to tell you, gun deaths happen every day. I think the um, f last figure I saw was that in 2016 there were 14,415 homicides in the U.S., of which 75 percent were gun-related, and 63 percent were in large urban areas like New York. Um, what we hope to do here is have a discussion with our first panelists about legislation. We're going to go for about 35, 40 minutes of discussion and Q&A between myself and the panelists, and then we'll open it up for questions. And then we'll move from there to our next panel. So I'd like to ask our speakers to come up, and I'll introduce them. On my immediate left and your right, we're really honored to have um, District Attorney Cy Vance, who was sworn in, as most of you know, as District Attorney of New York County, first in 2010, uh, re-elected in 2017. And among his accomplishments, achievements, his resume, uh, for our purposes, it's important to note that he's a co-founder and the co-chair of Prosecutors Against Gun Violence, which, as his name suggests, is a national organization um, with the major prosecutors from across the country uh, who are working on various legislation and, 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 and um, measures uh, to deal with, uh, to address gun violence. He created the first Conviction Integrity Program and Crime Strategies Unit uh, in, five, in the five boroughs. And one of his interesting accomplishments, which I note, is he's had 24 indictments against drug traffickers, leading to the removal of more than 3,000 illegal guns from city streets. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, during our, our discussion. Uh, uh, Richard Aborn, now on my first left, uh, is the president of the Citizens Crime Commission of New York City. And those of you who don't know the commission, it's probably the major um, organization dealing with criminal justice across the city, uh, involving business, um, law enforcement, and every other sector. Um, it's a nonpartisan 
a nonprofit organization which focuses on criminal justice and public safety in New York. And Richard himself has been working on gun issues since at least 18, no, 1992, <laughs> sir. Uh, when he was president of uh, Handgun Control, Inc., and that ended up involved, evolving into the Brady campaign. And many people refer to Richard as one of the principal architects of the passage of the Brady Bill um, and the ban on assault weapons and the ban on large capacity magazines. So he's got a lot of expertise behind him uh, to talk about. Uh, he works on gun violence issues in the US as well as Latin America. And in his spare time, he serves as president of Constantine and Aborn Advisory Services. And last but not least in the middle is Nick Suplina, who's the director of criminal justice policy and enforcement at Everytown for Gun Safety, an organization which I'm sure you are all aware of. Uh, he served as senior advisor to the New York State Attorney General, and among his other accomplishments and achievements, he created a crime gun tracing database uh, to combat interstate gun trafficking. Uh, he's also led attorney, the Attorney General's efforts to curb advertisements for illegal gun sales on Facebook and Instagram, and he's been coordinating a nationwide effort by Attorneys General to oppose federally mandated concealed carry reciprocity, a major bill uh, which we'll talk about. So let me um, uh, take a seat and begin our discussions. So I guess I'll sit here and yeah. maybe you want to sit well, okay. There's kind of a distance between us. <laughs> Steve, whatever you like. I want to start with um, uh, District Attorney Vance, perhaps as a, in the beginning, to give us first a sense of the, maybe a tour de horizon of the, um, where we stand now in terms of gun legislation, both federally, nationally, and in the state and city. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for including the Manhattan DA's office in this event. And uh, I am truly honored to be here with my colleagues, Nick uh, and Richard, who both, I think, have done amazing work, uh, both in policy and in practical protection uh, of our community. So it's great to be here. It's an important time to be having this discussion. I think New York State, locally, is, uh, is among the most, uh, not the most, but among the most uh, forceful states in terms of uh, gun legislation. I think where we need to go in the state of New York is we need to pass the, what they call ERPO, or Extreme Risk Protection Orders, so that when individuals are aware that in their family uh, someone has a violent disposition and has access to guns, a court can order that gun to be removed for a period of time. And I think that is now, uh, I can't remember, it hasn't passed the Senate, but I think it's it's up for a uh, vote perhaps by the end of this term. And I think that will be uh, probably the, uh, the bill that New York State can uh, make real progress with and, and advance the ball. And nationally, we'll talk, I'm sure, about uh, many bills. But for me, uh, uh, the biggest danger for New York is if the uh, NRA achieves its number one legislative priority, which is to pass what's called the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act, which is a long name which really means something very simple. It means that New York would have to honor the concealed carry permits of any other state in the union as if they were uh, legally operating them in their own, in their own county or, or, or city, uh, or those states who don't require permitting at all. Uh, they would be able to bring their guns into New York. And when you look at uh, the net effect of this, uh, it would be, I think, really drastic for New York. And we'll, I guess we'll talk later about it. But this is where I think, from my perspective, I've spent a lot of time over the last two years going uh, from one Senate office to another, uh, irrespective of whether I, I thought they were going to support me or not, really trying to make the case for New York. Well, let's talk a little bit about that now. The, the, um, I mean, that may be, I don't know if you agree, that may be the one uh, measure that perhaps most puts New Yorkers under threat, um, depending on how you define threat. And, and get into that a little bit more and deconstruct that for us. Sure. There are f about 60 million visitors who come to New York City each year. 40 million of them come from within America. If you permit uh, people to bring into New York City uh, their guns as if they were legally holding them in their hometown, for example, uh, West Virginia uh, has virtually no gun laws, and so a West Virginian could bring his or her weapon or many weapons into the city of New York, and you multiply, the, you, you figure out what percentage of 40 million people uh, would bring guns into New York City and uh, being able to carry them concealed, 
And it doesn't take much imagination to understand that's a dangerous thing. We are not like West Virginia. We are not a rural community. We are not like uh, Vermont, which used to be a, 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 a no permit carry state. We are a the densely, most densely populated county uh, in the biggest city in America. And so uh, our ability to prevent guns from being uh, used for both by criminals, brought in by criminals, as well as brought in by well-intentioned people who uh, who, but who bring a gun into a crowded Times Square environment and they get an offender bender and all of a sudden uh, you know, someone pulls out a gun because they're angry and it's a, it's a different, uh, it's a different um, uh, circumstance than elsewhere in the country. And, but first and foremost, I think what we need to understand is it's most dangerous for the police because they are going to be the ones who are going to be the front lines of dealing with literally hundreds of thousands of people who are coming into New York each year and they're not going to know which one of them has a concealed carry. They're not going to know whether they actually have a right to carry in their home state. And this is, uh, I, it's not just me saying this, it was Bill Bratton, it was Ray Kelly, it's Jimmy O'Neill. Every, every major police agency in the country thinks this is a disaster. But it is the number one uh, NRA legislative priority and this is why we cannot step back a minute from uh, trying to push back on that. So what complicates that now is there's sort of a patchwork of laws now determining who can get guns, who gets permits and licenses. There's a report out just recently by uh, Johns Hopkins University at uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Study of, Le of Gun Violence, which pointed out that if you have a, um, a full comprehensive um, background check, as you do in some states, and compare that to the uh, background check that requires law enforcement to look at and to look at your background, the differences in the results in gun homicides are astonishing. In particularly in large urban counties, they looked at um, 136 urban counties between 1983 and 2015 and actually found a 14% drop in gun homicides in those areas which have um, permit to purchase rules. So uh, would you, are we then facing, we've been so lucky in, in crime right now in New York, do you think the direct consequence of this will be a rise in homicides? And well, if, if those guns, if, if New York is forced to honor the concealed permits from other states uh, or those the right to carry from people from states which have require no permit at all you're 18 years old go buy a gun uh, yes it's I mean I don't think I'm doing I don't think I'm making a, 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 a an extreme prediction saying that that is going to increase violence in New York City. Well, you can't have hundreds of thousands of guns coming into Manhattan without having an increase in uh, risk to public safety and an increase of use of those firearms. And I, particularly uh, Rich, who's been so involved with this for so long, we are, and, and the audience knows this, New York is a miracle in terms of the ability uh, to have reduced gun violence. It is literally a miracle. And I would not want to do anything that would turn the clock back to those days when guns were all over the city and people were being killed. And I'll end on a political note. Um, the senator who votes for the Concealed Carry Reciprocity Act from Texas, from West Virginia, from uh, Arizona, they're not going to have to pay the price for the consequences of that act passing. It's us in New York City, they're gonna to have to pay the price for that, not our representatives in Washington, D.C. So this is where I think uh, in the world of politics, uh, we need as New Yorkers and those of us who deal with uh, folks who are in and out of D.C. Uh, to tell them how important this is for America's biggest city and they can't lose sight of uh, So the, the gun lobby might say that we're looking in the wrong direction, that our real problem is not legal or quasi-legal guns, it's illegal guns that come in here, and we still have problems regarding that. Sure we do. I do, and Richard's probably the, I'll turn to these guys, I don't want to monopolize the conversation to talk about what that actually means for New York. That's a good segue. Go ahead, Richard. So we're going to have a bit of a mutual admiration society here. Um, Cy has done yeoman's work on raising the consciousness, not just in New York, but in the country, around the dangers presented by the Carrying Concealed Bill. And I think by harnessing the power of what we call the people in blue, law enforcement, um, he's put up a bit of a barrier to the NRA. And I can tell you firsthand, because Wayne LaPierre has told me about 30 times, that their number one priority is to pass this bill. Um, 
it is it's a dangerous bill. And and Sai, you know this legislation, the proposed legislation, better than I do. But I think not only would this bill allow people from jurisdictions that have virtually no background check other than the basic NICS check or, or safety checks or any conditions under which to get a carry and conceal to bring their guns to New York, but it would also allow weaponry that's been banned in this state to come in to New York and it would come in legally. We, we hold clips now to 10 rounds. There are many states that have 15 round clips. I spent five years of my life banning those guns nationally. They could come back in here legally. So you have this disparate circumstance where the guy from Montana comes in with a 15 round ammunition uh, magazine. It's legal. You got the guy in New York who's got a 15 round ammunition magazine. It's not legal. So it leads to all sorts of disparate um, outcomes. And the, and the other way, to, I think, to answer your question, you asked essentially what's the most dangerous thing pending? What's the most dangerous thing that we could do? And, and I agree with this. This is one of the most dangerous things we could do. Um, the thing we also could do, which is not even on the table now, is pass a comprehensive scheme of gun control laws. So that we had a uniform set of laws across the United States so that the conditions under one which could get and carry a gun were uniform. Because the lack of that allows states that surround jurisdictions like New York, and I'll give you this data, or Chicago, or Boston, or New Jersey to be flooded with guns that come from outside their city and outside of their state. I think the data is about 75, maybe it's even higher, maybe 90% of all the guns used in New York City and crime come from outside of New York City, and the vast number also come from outside of New York State. Why? Because New York, since 1911, has had one of the most comprehensive, strictly enforced gun control laws in the country, and that is stopping those who would misuse guns, criminals, from getting guns while not interfering in any way with any law-abiding citizen's ability to get a weapon. So that's a bit of a model, and that's the kind of impact it has. And the other piece of data that's really interesting around this topic is that you see much higher rates of gun violence on a per capita basis in those states that have very weak gun control laws as opposed to those states where have very strong gun control laws. So I'll, I'll pick up where Sai left off. This is not a matter of policy. This never has been a matter of policy. This is a matter of politics. And, and when this country begins to get determined about this again, as we are now, like we did in the 90s, you're going to start to see some change. But until we get that, that, that sense of national resolve, that determination to understand these are gritty, long-term, brass-knuckle fights, it won't happen. But I think we're in a turning moment. So that's a good segue for Dick. Um, do you think it's realistic to think we're going to get that kind of national resolve? <clears throat> Well, and thank you for having me, and thank you for having every town here uh, with this distinguished panel. You know, I think we are in a national moment, and we are seeing a national resolve right now. That does not necessarily mean you are going to see national resolve in Congress in its current formation, uh, and that is an intractable problem. It's a political problem, uh, as as Richard said, uh, that can be solved. Uh, you know in November. Uh, but I think that the moment we're seeing right now, and I'll give you a little bit of a sense of just in the last 90 days, the way the country has shifted uh, in its view of, uh, you know, better sensible gun laws generally. So just in the several months since the tragedy in Parkland, we've had uh, 14 states pass meaningful uh, laws. We're talking about universal background checks, domestic violence relinquishment laws, red flag or, or ERPO laws, uh, bump stock bans, next denial bills so that when somebody tries to pass a background check and fails it, those that's referred to law enforcement for investigation. Um, and these bills are being passed in, in unlikely places. Um, so we have seen Florida, which has been referred to um, as the Petri dish of the NRA. It's where they try out their, their newest, latest ideas, pass what is really a significant package of bills under terrific public pressure to act, um, and seeing the politics shift such that it is now too dangerous to not start supporting sensible laws. Um, we're seeing Vermont, um, as the district attorney said, you know, not a state known for its uh, 
love of gun laws, in fact, has been a permitless state before permitless became in vogue, um, pass a package of really sensible bills, including universal background checks, uh, domestic violence relinquishment law, red, law, uh, red flag laws, all together, and signed into law by Republican um, governors. Uh, same so in it's really states that are carrying the weight. I mean, that's what you're basically saying. So, so states right now are where the action is uh, and where the promise is, but of course, Congress is the brass ring. Um, what you are seeing in Congress right now is the most entrenched um, control uh, of our elected officials by the National uh, Rifle Association and, and the gun lobby. Um, it, I don't predict that, like I said, I don't predict that changing uh, with the current makeup, um, but as we like to say at every town, you know, vote them out. If they're not going to support sensible gun laws, vote them out. And I think what you will see and what we, ha what we have seen in polling um, consistently since really the end of last year is more and more voters are putting um, guns and gun violence as their number one reason for voting, number one, number two. I mean, not five years ago, that was not breaking the top 10 list of why people were showing up at the polls. And we saw it in the Virginia special election, or the Virginia elections last fall, and we're seeing it now, and animated by new voters that are saying, we are gonna vote, and what we're, the issue we're voting on is gun, gun sense laws. And so that's a real promising moment. Yeah. Uh, the state-by-state -state fight is, however, not just being advanced by gun control advocates. It's a state-by-state -state strategy that has also been very successful for the NRA. If you go back five years ago, there were four states, uh, roughly, that had no permitting requirements whatsoever. This past year, that, that's up to 14. So as so the NRA is going legislature by legislature uh, in states like Missouri uh, that just recently eliminated uh, all permitting requirements. So it's making its play to dominate state laws and at the same time it's making its overarching play by trying to leapfrog all this by having a federal statute permitting uh, re carry reciprocity. How powerful country. and decisive are the prosecutors in this action? I mean, you, your, your group is is large, but it doesn't ca capture all the prosecutors. Obviously. It does, we, our group, Prosecutors Against Gun Violence, started about three years ago. It has about 35 plus members, and it represents many of the big, uh, the big cities, uh, and in New York City, the big counties in the big cities. I think we started it because there was the sense that prosecutors really weren't speaking with a voice on these issues, number one. Uh, that it wasn't about politics, it was about safety. And that whether you were Republican or Democrat, and these prosecutors are Republicans and Democrats, we all could come around to common sense uh, laws that would make our communities safer. And that the prosecutors from the big cities who represent millions of people, millions of voters, uh, had an opportunity and, I, and we thought an obligation to have our voices heard on these issues and to go to Congress uh, as a group and to let our positions be known. And, and I think we also have often a unique access to our senators and congressmen and women uh, who, are, who are interested in hearing what their prosecutor of their largest city thinks. Are they opening the doors for you? I don't think actually th th they're opening the doors for me. I think we just are just, not are, are just going in. And I think even the folks who are, uh, who are opposed to, uh, to the, our positions are letting us in. I think, I think we are talking with people who are on both sides of this, and I think you need to do both. So prosecutors, I don't think, have, had, have utilized their voices on these issues politically. Um, and to also to share the, the, the strategies that are working. My office has some fascinating strategies that we're working with Liz Glazer in the city of New York on uh, on technology and Richard, we're doing a lot of interesting stuff in New York that we are now telling prosecutors around the country, this is what's working in New York and vice versa, they share that with us. So that's the, that's the goal of the group and, uh, and so far I think we've actually uh, had an impact in uh, Washington DC, particularly as, as it pertains to the concealed carry arrest process. So we'll, we'll get into some of those practices in the next panel. Sure. Yeah. Can I, I just, I just want to amplify Sykes 
point a little bit on, on the politics, because the politics are really critical in this, as you've now heard for the last 15 minutes. Um, there, there are a number of reasons why we succeeded in beating the NRA in the 90s. And, and I'm going to tell you something, the NRA was just as big and just as mean and just as powerful as they are now, and everybody said to us, it's never going to happen. And, and I could spend an hour describing to you why it did happen. A lot of the credit goes to the people that work tirelessly out in the communities at the grassroots level, day in, day out, year in, year out. But I think one of the big game changers was when we persuaded law enforcement writ large, both the cops and the DAs, to come into the debate. Because there's something qualitatively different between having tragically a victim or an advocate, a civilian advocate, go to the Hill versus the folks in blue and, and the DAs. It's just a different voice. And the NRA had a hard time pushing back against that. And the members of Congress had a hard time turning them down. So I think Sy is actually being a little modest when he talks about how important this is. It's very, very, very important. I hope you're successful in getting the cops to come back on board because that's one of the game changers out there. Well, I, 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 Carry, they're not just on board; they're 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 right side by side. Uh, so I think the major city chiefs and the International Association of Chiefs, the rank and file, the rank and file, that that they may have a different point of view, but. Uh, I think the, those who are running police agencies, and uh, they're, they're, they're at our side, and we're right with them. So in the time we have left, let's look at the non-legislative remedies for this. I mean, what, besides changing the laws, changing um, the system for background checks, what are the other issues that you think will um, either nationally or on a state level or city level can help keep New Yorkers safe from gun violence? We will start there. So, um, actually, thank you for asking this, because when, when we were running the national gun control movement, we were adamant that legislation was not the sole answer, and we had to think about this comprehensively, that almost every aspect of society had some role to play in violence reduction. Violence is a very complex issue. It occurs for lots and lots of reasons, and the solutions aren't always readily apparent, and they're not strictly legislative, although legislation has a big role. So I think the city of New York right now is engaged in some of the most progressive non-legislative interventions of almost any other city in the country. And I could, I'll could, i tick them off, and if there are any of them that you want to dig into, I'm happy to do it. The city is now funding, I think it's 18 or 19 cure violence sites around the city. Cure violence is an epidemiologically based system based on the simple proposition that the best way to reach high-risk kids is to find people who have, quote, walked the walk. They will relate to those people, and they're called credible messengers, and they're now sites around the city, funded by the city, that intervene with high-risk kids. High-risk means have carried a gun, have been involved in a shooting, or have gone to jail for a shooting. So these are, you know, it's a rough crowd. Um, to reach those kids in a way that we've never been able to reach them again. Incredibly important. I think doing some of the in-house therapy, you know, multifamily systemic therapy that we're doing, incredibly important. Understanding the role of trauma and grief and betrayal in the commission of violence is incredibly important. So we're reaching out almost under a public health rubric in a way that we haven't done before. And then the, the DAs have been, I think, really quite sharp and, and pretty bold in saying not all crimes uh, deserve to be fully prosecuted, that we should take a number of crimes and take them off the criminal path relatively early on and get them into a variety of different diversion programs. And we don't have time to discuss all the matrix here. And that has been helpful. And I think third, I'm just going to very high level. I think it's been the growing understanding between criminality and mental health issues and not treating every single criminal in the exact same way, which is also a quasi public health model. Uh, model excuse me. I think that sort of thinking is really changing what's going on here. And we now have record lows in shootings in the city that's had record lows for I think the last four or five years, six years. I mean, astronomically low. So there's a bit of an intersection there with mental health, which is an issue the NRA keeps pushing. Nick, do you want to address that as well? 
uh, address the NRA's position on mental health. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a recurring theme in their statements. Um, I'm I'm waiting to see the proposal. Uh, you know, that never seems to come. Um, but I do. I, I mean, I, I want to reiterate what Richard was saying. The promise of, of local interventions. I mean, you can think of it along a spectrum, like you like you would any health public health problem from prevention, which is really what we're talking about when we talk about national or, or state laws. The laws that try to keep the guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them, the laws that try to uh, assist families or law enforcement in in removing guns from people at a difficult point in their life or who may make some bad decisions, um, all the way down to local strategies for intervention. The gun is in perhaps the wrong hands or is not legally possessed. How do we how do we intervene and how do we intervene effectively? So Cure Violence is a great model working really well in New York City to dramatically to, to reduce gun violence and uh, you know Correct me if I'm wrong, but most cure violence sites are working in an in a area that's ten blocks by ten blocks, if that. I mean it's it's very focused, very community driven. There are other programs like it um, that take similar models, uh, also very low hyper local, um, like hospital based interventions. Using that point where, you know, somebody who has been involved in a shooting is is actually been shot, um, that person at that moment in time becomes far more likely to either become a shooter or be shot again just at that second. It's a critical intervention moment um, and really interesting and and uh, you know proven uh, analyses of programs that are intervening at that moment sh tell, approaching the person at that critical moment in their life when they are literally wondering about their life and giving them opportunities to break the cycle, to not retaliate, to not go and, and get a plan and get back on the street and grab a gun and solve and solve this this beef, um, but instead have an opportunity. And then there are group, uh, group violence uh, programs which have proven effective as well, which are sort of somewhere in between, but which really, again, I identify those uh, persons that are most likely to engage in violence, and we're getting, you know, Maybe you can speak to this better and better at identifying, you know, who those likely candidates are. Because even in small neighborhoods with extremely high rates of gun violence, you're still not talking about most of most of the population is not engaged in any kind of illegal activity, let alone violent crime. You're dealing with a small per, small percentage. So, intervening early, ha making it clear that there are opportunities to to get out of the cycle of violence, but also a clear message that you know. There, there's law enforcement, criminal justice outcomes if you don't make the right choice. Mr. Hans. Uh, I couldn't agree more with everything everybody says have said, but I will say that at least when I started as DA, I think job number one is to deal with violent crime. And as, as a prosecutor, using enforcement strategies as well as other strategies. So I think what you've seen over the last 10 years is prosecutors' offices like mine have created uh, units whose job it is to find out who in this zone of violence, which you're tracking, who is driving crime there. And to then explicitly focus on how do you build cases to identify the crime drivers and then through enforcement strategies and others to dismantle those gangs. And that is where I think the, the work of the NYPD and the work of the prosecutors has merged. They uh, It began with Ray Kelly, it continued through Bratton and O'Neill, and we are really both looking at uh, who are the few people uh, involved with uh, gang and gun violence that we need to identify. Uh, we also have to be really tough on gun traffickers. Uh, we need a law in New York, in my opinion, to have a kingpin gun statute so that if you bring in 20 guns, uh, you are facing an A1, uh, you know, an A1 uh, sentence of, of 25 to life. Right now, whether you bring 10 guns in or 10,000 guns, uh, it's still a B violent felony. And I think gets you what? Which gets you, it can get you a lot of time, but when you, but gun traffickers are merchants of death. That, th there's no other way to put it. They're bringing guns into the hands of people who are in the business of using guns for their business, as well as getting into the hands of kids. So I look at that group, 
folks who are making money off selling guns illegally in New York City as the group that needs to be identified uh, and eliminated if we can. And it's, it's not easy as Rich can, and both guys can, here can say through their study of how gun flows uh, through. Well, let me, yeah. they, they, these hard strategies are also essential. Hard enforcement strategies are also essential to get violence down to a level where we can now be having a discussion where about alternatives to indictment, alternatives to incarceration. When you had uh, homicides you know, five times what they were today in New York City, there was no tolerance for alternatives to detention. This is, as Bill Bratton would say, a point where we have gotten uh, violence down enough so that we can start using peace dividend and to think more differently. That's a very interesting point. Let me, uh, I want to open it up to questions if we could in the time we have left. And um, if you have a question, we can go on with our discussion, but I'm sure you will have questions. My only request is that it is a question and that the second, fold, the second point, it has to be about guns. I know there's a lot of other issues that you might want to raise with D.A. Vance and the other uh, speakers, but the time we have left, uh, let's make sure that what we're talking about is gun policy. So. Um, we have a mic there. Maybe if um, we can bring it around. Fran, you want to? We can either bring it to you or you can come up, come up to the front. Come on here. And please say your name. Certainly. Question on Yes, yes. I wasn't going to ask about cheese. Uh, thank you. My name is Ken Brown. and. To begin to violate what you just said, um, I'm the district manager of Bronx Community Board 5, where we have a violence intervention program called BRAG, and it's very well regarded and very well. Please expand that. We, we need it and we appreciate it. Sorry. <laughs> okay. You can continue in that range. But, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit and maybe push back around the prosecutors against gun violence. It's my impression and I'm not sure if this is warranted, that <clears throat> the discussion about the expansion or the, or the preservation of gun rights is a proxy for neo-Nazi expansion and white supremacist uh, expansion. And if, it, if a group like Prosecutors Against Guns Violence is big city based and oriented, can that be used to obfuscate the alt-right element in the gun group by saying this is not a gun issue, this is the big liberal cities imposing upon us. So I wonder if there's a political blowback around that. You're talking really about cultural issues that arise. I mean, it's really I, cultural conflict. I would respond first that we are... Uh, Often uh, there's many Republicans, uh, as there are Democrats, uh, in in our prosecutors represented in our association. Uh, it is true that we have more major city prosecutors than small counties, but we do have some smaller counties. Uh, and at the end of the day, though, I have never, in the years that I've been using the platform of prosecutors against gun violence to talk to elected officials in D.C. or elsewhere, have ever had you know, have ever had that issue come up. It's because I think we come in with a certain amount of credibility. That is, our job is to reduce violence in our communities, and that's this. It's really not anything more complicated than that. I'm not. I'm not in it for money. I'm, uh, and we are. We are viewed, I think, as credible messengers ourselves, uh, along as our police officers on on this issue. Uh, and uh, I. I I'm sure that we are criticized by conservative or, or the NRA. I know we are, but that, that's that's okay. Well, one thing that has been mentioned we haven't talked about yet are the gun makers themselves, the gun industry. And and have you had any interactions or coordination with them? I have not, and I think, frankly, it's uh, it's a lost opportunity. I, I wish I had been more engaged on that aspect. I've sat with the former head of the NRA to talk about areas that we might be able to work together. But I think Richard has is much more involved in discussions with manufacturers, and I defer to him. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about the discussions, but I will tell you that um, the NRA is quite good at rallying their base to attack any gun manufacturer that may in any way look towards doing anything that would be positive in terms of gun safety or gun control. Um, 
I'm sorry, but I've, I've, I've actually forgotten the manufacturer. I don't know if it was, it was Smith & Wesson, right? Smith & Wesson actually had the audacity to contemplate thinking about a smart gun, which would be a very smart thing to do. You want to take care of gun trafficking in the United States? Give us the technology of smart guns. And the NRA just went after them, hook, line, and sinker, and, and stopped them from doing it. Now, I will say one of the very promising signs is that some big corporations in the United States are starting to take on the NRA. Not manufacturers, but banking institutions, airlines, etc. in a way that we haven't seen before. And that's encouraging. And that needs to be promoted because that could help change the culture around this. Do you want to, I think you have another question yeah, right sure. there. No. Hi, it's Linda Raftery. I'm just a regular citizen person. I don't work on up? any of these issues um, directly, but I'm curious if there are any policy issues that you could be working on related to domestic violence and guns, because I feel like a lot of people that are using guns are using them against domestic partners, and that, that also is a sim, sort of like a precursor oftentimes to people who are doing other types of mass crimes with guns or other types of gun violence. Is that to you, uh, Mr. Vance, or any of the other panelists? Okay. I, it's a very, very good point and, and question, and the correlation between a uh, domestic violence situation um, ending up in a, a death where the, where there's a gun present in the home versus not is is terrifically high. One of our legislative priorities, and and um, the other panelists can talk about how this is how this is executed, but are what's called um, domestic violence relinquishment bills. And you don't necessarily need a bill to do it, but uh, bills are helpful. Most of them are drafted to state that um, upon entry of a protective order um, by a court uh, in a domestic violence situation, there's mandatory um, relinquishment of any firearms owned or in the home. Um, and the this is a relatively new development, um, but what studies have been conducted on that show uh, an extremely positive uh, impact. It's a really important issue. We're, we're seeing right now in Rhode Island, which just uh, implemented uh, mandatory relinquishment in domestic violence cases, we're starting to see numbers tick down, um, and it's an, it's an incredibly important um, uh, issue. I think it is an incredibly important issue and is getting attention and is making progress around the country. It's a little interesting in New York City. There are very few people in Manhattan who are licensed gun owners uh, in Manhattan. And so we really don't have this issue. Uh, we have people who have guns illegally, um, but we don't have, as you might have in, a, as in some big cities like L.A., or, or there's a lot of folks who who are permitted to own guns and have gun permits. It's just hard to get one in Manhattan. Another question? And then, oh, we got lots of questions. Okay, so... Um, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shakuntala Tulak. Okay. I'm hoping that somebody will be able to... I'm confused about the NRA. And perhaps somebody can help me. I'm scared of guns. I want nothing to do with guns. And... Um, from what I know about the NRA is what I heard on TV or the newspaper. They are an organization that registers their guns, they get their permit, they renew their permit, and they uh, renew their, um, uh, what did I say just now, the, uh, they, they renew their permit, they renew their um, registration. So uh, as far as I saw on the television, uh, the NRA is being blamed for these massacres in the schools and all over. So, so what's your, I would your like, question? Yeah, my question is, could somebody explain to me why they're being blamed? As I said before, I want nothing to do with guns. I'm scared of them. But please explain to me about the NRA, why they're accused of, uh, you know, these violence. So I'm going to be really blunt. Okay. Really blunt. Because I, I have fought these guys for years now. It's because... To understand. It's because they have their hand around the neck of Congress, and they squeeze, and they squeeze, and they squeeze until members vote their way. And the reason they do that is that there's a leadership of the NRA that are absolutist, 
that have never met a gun control law that they like, that they will fight every single gun control law that we put up, and they will argue to their members that if one law is passed, that is the beginning of the slippery slope to a ban on all guns. They've said it about me numerous times. They've opposed us numerous times. That's the reason. This notion that their membership engages in the kind of conduct you said probably is true in the states where registration and re-permitting is required. That's not many states. It is also true that the vast number of members, members of the NRA are, are excellent law-abiding citizens, probably people in this room who will never mishandle a gun and frankly probably in their hearts support a lot of what we want and in fact the polls show that. However, the NRA has said to their membership that we want to take away all of their guns. We want a total ban on all guns in America. And the reason they've done that is very cunning and it's because they understand that they cannot meet us on the grounds of reasonableness. It is not reasonable that assault weapons are available to the civilian population in the, in the United States. And I can go on and on with that. The reason they've done that is they want to appeal to the intrinsic motivation, the self-interest of their membership so that if their membership even thinks about supporting us, they'll stop because they'll be afraid that we're going to take away all their guns. And that's how you build sustainable national grassroots movements. Okay, next question. Okay, here we go. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Yablon. I'm a reporter for The Trace, uh, which is a nonprofit website that covers gun issues. And I've been following the New York State uh, ERPO statute pretty closely. Um, it has passed the assembly and committee and sort of now up to the, uh, the state Senate majority leader, who is a Republican. Um, I'm curious what, how you see, uh, what, what kind of leverage do you think gun violence prevention advocates, Democrats have to push uh, the Republicans who control the state Senate to actually bring this legislation to the floor? Yeah. Well, it, it, I can respond in, in general terms. I think the gun control advocates and everyday New Yorkers can agree that there's comes a time even in a law-abiding gun owner's life where because of um, a problem that they're facing or um, an abuse of, of alcohol or drugs that no, they know or threats they've made um, on Facebook pages that they should not have their gun. Maybe not forever, but not for a small period of time. So I, I will say that that you've identified the you know leader of the Senate as a Republican should not matter one iota to this very sensible law that, like I said at the top of the hour, has passed in all red states, red red state houses, red governors. Um, this is a law that gun owners, um, avid gun owners, uh, support because they all know somebody. They all have somebody in their family who they say. Ugh, it would be it would be good if we could make a phone call and just you know separate that person from their firearm temporarily while maybe a moment in their life passes. So uh, you know I can't pro prognosticate on on what the uh, outcome is on that bill. I'm very hopeful that it will pass. And recently, uh, the, you know the governor has supported it, um, and so that's a good sign. But what I can say is the red blue Republican Democrat on a law like this shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be an issue. But, but, the, but the, se the, the, second, the second part of your question is critically important, which was, what is the role that gun control advocates have to play in this? And it is critical. It is absolutely critical because, whether it's guns or anything else, most legislative bodies never act in a preventive way unless they're forced to. And they can be forced to only by a well-organized population group that goes after them in a relentless way. And the strength that gun control organizations and gun control advocates bring is the tenacity to, to go to Albany and to go to the local town hall meetings and go to the local editorial board and go to the local chief and make sure that those people are engaged with the local member of the Senate. 
um, as Tip O'Neill famously said, all politics is local. It's particularly true of advocacy politics. It's all about grassroots. If you can get the grassroots inflamed, you will win these fights. So to me, it's absolutely critical. And I actually think we're kind of close. The governor came out for it two days ago with a bill. There's sort of a uniform sense around what the bill should do. As Nick has said, a number of states have passed it. It is intrinsically logical. Interestingly, the NRA is not quite sure how to fight this one, which is good. But uh, if the advocates back away, this won't pass. Okay. Oh, hi. My name. Uh, did you have something else to say? Um, my name is Elise Lang, and I teach at Lehman College. Um, I just want to thank you all for all your hard work. Um, so my question is: um, a lot of times in these mass shootings in high schools, the shooter gets the gun from an unlocked case where the parent has left the gun lying around, and so the minor uh, conducts the horrible carnage. Why can't the adults ever be indicted? And I'm sure it's been tried, but I'm just wondering why why aren't adults indicted? So it, it is not by definition a crime to leave a gun unlocked. Um, to me, it's an act of extreme negligence, but extreme negligence is not a penal violation. However, um, there are a number of states, and I'll bet Nick knows the number off the top of his head because he's, he's like a walking database, um, that have passed what we call safe storage laws, which we have been advocating for for a number of years. They're very simple. They say, if you are a gun owner, you are required to keep that gun locked up, and, the am and, and most of them say, and the ammunition separated from the gun, particularly if there are, if there are children in the home. And, good chance there are children at home, whether it's a friend or one of your own children. And I don't recall the data, and I'll bet Nick has it, but... What are the those, penalties for that? And so, so, in many states, there's actually a penal sanction for violation of that. Then you can prosecute. And in those states that have passed it, New York is not yet one, right? We, we've not passed it yet. No, we've not passed it yet. Um, we've seen a pretty big impact on both accidental shootings and on teen suicide. And the reason is the presence of a gun in the home, if there's a teen there, the chance of the teen suicide goes up fivefold because teens are, because of the biology, teens are very impulsive and a gun is a very impulsive weapon, right? Once you pull the trigger, it's over. So they're very important laws. Now, speaking of impulse, New York City has, so as we tell know, who you are, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jordan Auslander, mm, bystander. Bystander. <laughs> um, citizen. Here we go. Citizen. citizen. So, New York City has some pretty tough gun laws, yet, uh, in our wisdom, we have issued gun permits to the likes of Bill Cosby and Donald Trump Jr. and Sr., who may not be the best example of this, but it sort of shows how the 1% can get around pretty much anything. Um, but Mr. Aborn, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. The problem is, is that these standards aren't national. Right. Now, we know that a state does not get its federal highway funds if their uh, automobile driver's licensing and registration doesn't meet a federal standard. Is there a way to apply that sort of incentive, um, either through BATF or whatever funding would hit the states at their core, if they don't meet an agreed upon, that's the magic word, licensing and registration standards for firearms. A absolutely. The problem is you need legislation or regulation to do that. And, and so you, you cycle right back to the political issue. We just don't have the strength on the Hill right now in order to do that sort of thing. And in fact, many people have used precisely that example. There's also in the Highway Safety Act a requirement that if speed limits are above 65 miles, per, it's now 65, 65 miles an hour, you can't get uh, federal funding. We, you know, we could do things like that. So yes, the answer is we have no lack of ideas about how to do this. Again, it's back to the, po to the politics of it. It's the politics that are so difficult. So, so what, what Richard did, I think, so well in the Brady Group was to ban uh, assault weapons. Uh, and that, over the time period of that legislation, resulted in a great reduction uh, in, in deaths. But we don't even have the will in Congress to ban assault weapons yet because that's expired. So unfortunately, it's a great idea, but there are many things that are much more obviously uh, problematic and dangerous that Congress just simply 
or the majority of Congress simply won't support. And I think it's for the reason that Richard identified, because the NRA uh, has got them in a stranglehold politically and will oppose them uh, and will knock them out of office if they can, if they don't agree with the NRA's position. So we've got time for one more question, maybe one and a half if your question is short on <laughs> Short as I can, yeah. Um, I'm wondering what the uh, plans might be, although the law has not been written yet for the NRA concealed uh, weapon um, law, in terms of constitutionality of that, and maybe even from a public health angle. Well, uh there are going to be uh, constitutional challenges immediately if uh, that federal legislation were to uh, pass. We in New York City, Manhattan, has already gone together with the city of New York, and I think Liz represents Liz Glazer represents the city here, uh, in uh, to be prepared to f seek injunctive relief immediately uh, if that passes before it can be implemented. And I think there will be uh, a Tenth Amendment strong challenge constitutionally to that law if it passes. It's ironic that the individuals, typically the conservatives who are among the most rabidly supportive of uh, states' rights on this issue of concealed carry uh, are the throw states' rights out the window and believe that any state's law should apply to everywhere else. I think there's actually a real Tenth Amendment uh, challenge to that law if it passes, and I, and I, I think it, it's one that may well prevail. Okay, one more. Yes, sir. Um, I wonder uh, whether the uh, NRA uh, uh, is such a an, an, an absolute animal <laughs> with the, just basic instincts that tells them to go out and shoot and kill and eat. Right? Now, isn't it possible? And I, I'm very naive, you know, but it's possible that a percentage of the, of the membership have uh, a brain, a heart, and a soul. And if approached in a certain way that would allow them to say, you will always have the basic freedom to go hunting and blah, 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 blah. But this is a, this is a profound issue on the value of the human life in society. So, uh, the, the second point, uh, I think it would be very good to, to approach or challenge the religious leadership of the country, whether they're the cardinals or the Protestants and, or the Jews or what they are, and say this is a moral issue and if you have courage, prove it. So both so are, that, uh, these that, are all very good points, I think, to end up on. So maybe I'll give it to each of you to sort of respond and do some closing remarks. So I, I could not think of a more perfect question to end this on, so I thank you for that. I'm going to answer them in reverse. First, what is the role of the religious community? And then what is the role of sort of the NRA membership that has a heart, a soul, and a brain? Um, the I will tell you that when we were working on this issue in the 90s, the 1990s, Steve, I don't want you to get that confused, the 1990s, that we worked tirelessly with, um, with churches, with synagogues, with mosques, with the religious leadership, with the, the U.S. Conference of Bishops, um, I mean, every single religious group we could get involved with, get involved, and they came in in great ways. We had coordinated sermon Sundays. We did tons of things across the United States to do exactly exactly what you're suggesting, bringing that moral voice that the religious community so wonderfully represents. So you're right, um, I hope it happens again, um, but it's a very important voice and they were key in our, in our successes in the past. In terms of the NRA membership, it, it somewhat harkens back to what I said before. The, and I'll give you a, sort of a less emotional answer. The, they just get me really angry. The, um, the, the polling shows that a lot of NRA members actually support what we seek, which in broad ways is licensing, universal background checks, reinstating the ban on assault and, and uh, large magazines, safety training, one gun a month. That's pretty much it. There's with some nuance in there. The polling shows support for that. However, what the NRA has done to keep those members that were drifting towards us at bay is argue this is not about licensing or registration or one gun a month. 
this is really about banning all guns and that the gun control movement is adopting a slippery slope strategy as opposed to going to everything at once. And the reason they do that is because they've understood that if, and, and think about this historically, if you want to build a sustainable grassroots movement, you've got to make sure the constituency that's going to fuel that movement has an intrinsic motivation to stay involved. Go back to women's right to vote choice, civil rights, gay marriage, the constituency of all of those national movements were, were by and large people that is something to gain or something to lose. The NRA has understood that, so they've given their membership something to protect. And, and you are absolutely right. The, the, and to me, the next, and I've worked a lot on this, not successfully, the next big frontier in the advocacy world for gun control is to try and identify precisely the people you're talking about and get NRA members to start drifting away from the leadership and come to us. A, a large number of us have tried very quietly in some pretty well-funded ways, but we're struggling. We, we're having trouble peeling them off. But it's a great question, and, and you're right. Well, I, I really cannot say it better than, than Richard just did. I'll add only that um, they are peeling off. Um, the control exerted by the leadership of the NRA and the increased radicalization of the agenda, it's kind of not about guns so much anymore as it is a cultural uh, a culture war that's being framed in terms sometimes of they're coming to take your guns, but it's about liberty, it's about the media, it's everyone is against you, um, and it fits quite honestly a national narrative that we're seeing more at the highest levels of government these days days, um, casually discussing uh, the need to prepare for potentially an armed resistance against an encroaching government. I mean, that's not having a debate about whether your registration system is infringing on my Second Amendment rights. That's a whole nother bag. That said, the members of the NRA, they say about five million members, represent such a small fraction of gun owners roughly 100 million gun owners in the, in the country, maybe a little less, 5 million in the NRA. Most of them, as Richard said, do support the very laws uh, that we are pushing. The statistics are overwhelming. And so what you have is an organization that's not necessarily accountable to its members still pushing a, a, a radical agenda. And at the end of the day, it's because the fear sells guns. Um, historically, after each of these tragedies, gun sales spike. And they're not spiking because people say, you know what, I think it's time for me to have a gun. People who already have 10 are buying their 11th because the NRA sends out their email or letter saying, this time they're definitely going to take your guns. Stock up while you can. It's very manipulative strategy. I don't believe it's a sustainable business strategy, let alone a political or cultural one. Um, but we've got a lot of work to do before we can claim success in this area. The event's the last word goes to you. Uh, I remain optimistic. And uh, I think I've come to this world of gun control relatively recently as district attorney, but there are people here who've been working on this for 20 and 30 years. And so what I would see characterize what's happening today is this is a generational struggle. Uh, but we should also know that in the last two years, I think the country has moved a long way toward understanding uh, the wisdom of bans against assault weapons and the wisdom of many of the basic safety provisions that we're talking about today. Uh, and we have a whole generation of young people who have now stepped forward, starting in Parkland, to, uh, to do what the adults failed to do before them. So we are at a point, I believe, where uh, we who are older need to support those who are younger uh, in their uh, in their movement today uh, but we are now seeing as Nick has said state by state there are states that are being more sensible even states that were resiliently oppositional like Vermont things are changing but it's generational this is going to be a struggle we're going to be in for a long time but I think we're moving generally in the right direction so it's time to uh, move into our next panel but please join me in thanking our speakers today for a excellent start And I'd like to bring up Jared Murphy um, of City Limits, our co-sponsor.
Hi, everybody. I'm Jarrett, editor of City Limits. Um, as the next panel comes up, and you guys can come on up, um, it strikes me it's a warm summer afternoon. Uh, the room is a little, a little close. You've been listening intently for like an hour. So uh, in the way of um, stretching some muscles and building community, let's do something that we do in church every week, which is to turn to the person to your right or left or behind you, introduce yourself, um, stretch your arm muscles, exercise your vocal cords, meet your neighbors, and we'll get settled up here. So nice to see you. Glad to be on this panel with you. Yeah. I'm hiding. You guys can hold the one. I'm going to give you each a microphone. I hope you use it well. So that one's yours. No bopping anybody over the head with your microphone. Yes. You don't trust us to no. share. Right? No. That's right. Don't, don't pretend like it's a gun and start shooting at the end. All right, that's enough. That's enough socializing. Let's get back to the task at hand. I think that first panel was terrific, um, and I think what they did really was open the door that we're going to walk through um, more uh, decisively with this panel, which is that as important as the national discussion is, as, as important as the discussion about law is, that regardless of how the political climate evolves, regardless of whether state or federal laws are strengthened or loosened, the future of gun violence and safety from it in New York City is going to largely be shaped by people who are not going to be a part of those policy or legal discussions, by uh, people much closer to the ground, police officers and teachers, uh, youth workers and parents, potential shooters and potential victims. And so the people we have on stage now are folks who in their day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week either are uh, among those people or keep very close tabs on what they're doing. And so I'd like you to join me in welcoming uh, my distinguished panel, starting on my immediate left, uh, Liz Glazer, the director of the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Welcome. You can clap. It's okay. Yeah. That's important exercise, too. Heidi Hines, the executive director of the Mary Mitchell Community Center in the Bronx. And Michael Palladino, the president of the Detectives Endowment Association. So this is an issue where if you, if you live in New York City or, or maybe most places in America, it, it doesn't take many degrees of separation before you become affected by gun violence. I think we could all probably think of one or two ways that we've been affected by it. Um, and it is a personal issue and it's important to be personally engaged. So I wanted to start by going, kind of um, starting with, with, with Liz, how you come to the issue um, and what your work on it involves um, you know, on a regular basis. Sure. So um, oh. we each have our own microphone, so we're a step up from the last panel. La, la, la. Um, so I actually want to take a little trip down memory lane, if I might. Um, in 1990, murders in the city were north of 2,200. And I think everybody probably remembers that. Um, just to give you a sense of context, last year they were under 300. Uh, and in the early 90s, I was a prosecutor, a federal prosecutor here in New York. Uh, I headed up the organized crime section of that office. Um, and at the time, La Cosa Nostra was all the rage. My office had uh, taken down uh, the five families had made inroads into many of these uh, issues. And that was sort of what occupied the press. Meanwhile, <laughs> while the Colombo family was involved in a war with the Bonanno family and 13 people had been killed, in the Bronx, on Bryant and Seneca Avenue, two crews there had murdered more than 39. And that was sort of by what was then the shipping news. Um, and I say that just because, um, and I was thinking about this when I was reading your article, Jared, um, that we live in an era now when mass shootings very much capture the public imagination, but the sort of pitter-patter of daily urban violence 
is less on the front page and very much to kind of the credit of the Parkland uh, kids, they've joined cause with Chicago and with other places. Um, so we do live in a different world now, certainly in New York City. Um, our murders are at a fraction of what they were. Our crime is way down. Um, and at the same time, the crime uh, is, you know, we're... We often say, and it is true, we are the safest big city in the U.S. Um, also, the touch of enforcement is down. So stop and frisks are down by 94%. Summonses are down by over 60%. Uh, this is in the last four years. Um, misdemeanor arrests are down by almost 30%, even as crime goes down, and even as incarceration goes down. Uh, also, the lowest incarceration rate of any big city in the nation. Um, but the thing that is so striking, and this is sort of, I think, what might go to the heart of what we may end up talking about, is that even though crime, particularly shootings, are reduced so much that we see that the neighborhoods in which those shootings and that violence happen are the same now as they were in the 1990s. So if you were to look at the top 10 precincts uh, that occupied sort of the shooting roster, um, the top of the shooting roster in the early 90s and look at them last year, over half of them are the same. It's Brownsville and Mott Haven and East New York. And if I were to show you maps of where high asthma, high unemployment, low educational achievement is, it would be those very same neighborhoods. And those are also neighborhoods where uh, our fellow New Yorkers who are African American and Latino live. And there is a deep sense of estrangement um, not just from police, but from government. And this is really a major problem uh, and something that we have to address in a much more um, heterogeneous way uh, than the way in which we've addressed it in the past, which is to focus so much on uh, the very important role that police play, but now the very important role that neighborhoods play as well, um, and must in sort of making uh, safety much more organic and durable and we can talk more about what those things are. I don't want to hog the time. Richard talked a little bit about cure violence, and there are some other things, and I know that this is a lot of your work. So. Certainly. Uh, that's a great segue to Michael. You've been uh, protecting New Yorkers since 1979 as a member of the NYPD, so I'm sure guns have been a part of that work, and probably as DEA president as well. How do you come to this conversation? Well, you know, I was uh, born and raised in the Bronx, and I majored in accounting at Fordham University. University. How I ended up in law enforcement, uh, here I am 39 years later, I still, I don't know. But, uh, um, and I did work the, uh, the streets of the Bronx. I'm currently the president of, the elected president of two organizations. Of course, the NYPD detectives, we have 5,600 active, 13,000 retired. And I'm also the president of the New York State Association of PBAs and represent about 40 different PBAs for lobbying purposes up in Albany. For about eight years, I was the national vice president also of the of NAPO, National Association of Police Organizations. I only mention that because I, uh, my purpose there was to lobby on, uh, on the hill down in Washington, D.C. for cops throughout the country. Uh, so I'm very, very familiar with um, lobbying both on the hill and up in Albany. And as far as gun violence is concerned, I, I worked in two Bronx precincts, and I couldn't agree with you more. The precincts that were considered A houses then, I would consider them still A houses today. Just the people have changed a little bit. But um, yes, so I worked in uniform, in, in, in plain clothes, and I worked in the Bronx Narcotics Division for a few years. Earned my detective shield there, uh, then went into a detective squad, uh, and then you know got involved in the union business. And I'm familiar with gun violence because I worked in those precincts in the 80s and the 90s when crime was just completely out of control and just about everyone seemed to be carrying a gun. And unfortunately, I'm very familiar with gun violence. Unfortunately, I had to take someone's life in the performance of duty or they were going to take mine. Uh, so, you know, I had some real close experiences with that. And... Um, 
today how I feel, and I'm speaking as, as, as a citizen, I'm not speaking in my capacity in the union because I haven't polled the people that, that I represent, but you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of torn, I'm an advocate uh, for the Second Amendment, uh, the right to bear arms, but not blindly, like the NRA seems to be. I certainly believe uh, in the right to bear arms, but I also believe that um, that you should be uh, tested. You should uh, there should be. Um, Checks, background checks, criminal checks. God, I think they should be. There should be psychological checks. I know before you come into the NYPD, you go through a very strict psychological testing. There's a test, and there's face to face with the psychologist. They want to make sure that you're mentally prepared to carry a weapon because you have life and death in your hands. So how in these states, and even in our own state, how they hand guns over to people with a carry permit, and they never. They they never um, tested them psychologically is is something that boggles my mind. So I'd like to see that uh, in uh, you know before you give anybody a gun permit. And and if they say the taxpayer should bear that expense, no, the person who wants the gun they should bear the expense. Get a psychologist and you know let's let's hold them accountable a little I should, bit. Uh, I should mention Michael before I turn it over to Heidi that and I think I said this to you earlier, um, Michael Heidi and I. I all graduated from Fordham in the Bronx. Liz had this fortune of going to Harvard. We'll see if she can keep up. But um, <laughs> Heidi, why don't you talk about uh, sort of your entree to this conversation? Uh, thank you, Jarrett, for having me. This is really um, great. Uh, so I work at a community center in the Bronx in the Cretona section, and I lived in the Bronx for 30 years, mostly in the Fordham Bedford section. And both where I work and where I live is a place that still, even with the reduction of violence, has gun violence regularly. And so the first thing I wanted to just ask is, by a show of hands, how many people here live in a neighborhood where gun violence is like a regular thing? Yeah. So I just want to um, affirm to you that I agree that that is unacceptable, right? Totally unacceptable, even though it's better than it was before. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, first at the Mary Mitchell Center in late 2009, there was a shootout right next to the backyard. So we're doing an after school program, kids are in the backyard and there's a shooting there, it's drug related. We have a big public meeting, we invite HIDA, high intensity drug trafficking areas, and we explain to them what's going on. Within six months, the drug czar himself comes out, takes a tour, actually not only of Crotona, but of my block, because my block is very hot. Within 18 months, they've done a huge bust, heroin bust. It turns out the same people on my block and two blocks away from the center were all involved in the same thing, causing a lot of violence in both neighborhoods. And things did quiet down for a while, but you simply can't arrest your way out of this, right? We wish we could. We tried that, and that just doesn't work. So then I, I want to turn, turn to uh, in 2016 on Valentine Avenue, there was a shooting where a teenager um, shot and killed it. Actually, it was, there was just a lot of shooting going on at that time. And there was even a police officer on the corner. And they still were able to shoot and kill this young person on my block. And then within three weeks, another, so the one was killed on Valentine and 194th, then one on Briggs and 194th, then one on Creston and 194th. And you know, the day after the shooting on my block happened, I went out and you know how there are sort of makeshift memorials, so candles and usually bottles of Hennessy, stuff like that. And there was a young person there and I, I was talking to him about how sad it was, how tragic. And he told me that there was nothing that I or anyone else could do to stop the violence. And I'm just going to go back then. Right after the shootout in the backyard of the Mary Mitchell Center, we brought all the kids together and we did an exercise that was supposed to make them feel like we could try to, we were going to keep them safe. 
the people at Fordham said you should talk to them about the fact that you work every day to keep them safe so that there was a shooting and then there was a sharing time and we're talking about five to 12 year old kids five to 12 years old every single one of them had had an experience of violence that was equal to or greater than being caught in a shootout. It's totally unacceptable, right? Children cannot be worried about whether or not we can keep them safe. And so I think that's why we're here, is because we believe we can keep them safe. And I just want to say that one of the things that we uh, figured out after that was the power of the cure violence model, which says treat violence as a contagious disease. And it has been incredibly effective. Hundreds of days in the, in the most violent neighborhoods without a shooting. Not without a murder, without a shooting. Because just imagine, you're a parent, you were a kid, you're young, some of you, and you're just afraid every day that you could get hurt, really shot, doing walking to school. So there was a sh so last year in, in April, the last thing I'm going to say, last year in April there was a shooting at around 3.30. All the kids had just gotten out of school. It was in, it's the, the fight started in the backyard of the school between adults. It ended with someone being murdered by a gun while every, while all the kids were walking home. I mean, we can do better than that, right? So that's a good point to talk with Liz about what, you know, in the 90s, the narrative was, and this might not have been totally true, that the crack trade was what drove the extreme high levels of violence we saw. Um, leaving that aside, what, what drives the gun violence we have now? Is it gangs? Is it domestic violence? Is there any kind of a pattern that you see? So uh, we know that a big portion of it is domestic violence. Um, that's becoming a bigger portion as we shrink everything else. And so I think the previous panel talked a lot about domestic violence, and that's something that we still, um, I don't think, have a way into in the way in which I think we've started to have a way into other kinds of gun violence. Um, the other things I think you know the police will tell you are um, their disputes. They're often personal disputes. They're often uh, people who are engaged in other kinds of illegal businesses, uh, whether drugs or other things. Um, but it's remarkably lower than it was. Um, so, you know, if you had 300 shootings in Brownsville in 1993, last year you had a little under 30. 30 is still a lot. And if you're living in Brownsville or you're living, uh, you know, in those neighborhoods in the Bronx, that's your reality. Um, but I think the sort of the thing that I would say is I think that you made an incredibly powerful point, which is in the 90s, it seemed like the only way in, because things were, were very hot, was we would arrest people, we'd take them out, the neighborhood would calm down. Um, and I think there's a different dynamic going on now uh, in which, and maybe it's because we sort of have a moment of peace to some degree, um, that's permitting neighborhood groups that have always been there and have always been working on this to really sort of uh, rise up and, and flourish. Cure violence is one way. There's something called the crisis management system in New York City that Richard talked about in the earlier panel, which takes cure violence as its core, these violence interrupters, but wraps around it a whole array of other things, including uh, jobs, uh, mental health services, uh, all kinds of other engagements. And this is very neighborhood-based, uh, very ground up. Uh, and I think if what we're going to, if really what we're talking about is, you know, we had a whole panel on laws and on prosecution and other things. At the end of the day, how do you stop gun violence? You change behavior. And we have 
relied upon laws or on handcuffs to change behavior, but there are a lot of other ways to do that, and neighborhood norms are one, and how we treat one another is another, and I think one of the things that you've seen in New York with respect to kind of the reductions in, in crime is there's been a gentling of the city. Uh, there's sim it's not that it's been displaced, it's that people do not commit as many crimes, and we have to start at that heart of don't carry your gun, don't shoot your gun. Michael, if you could talk about, uh, obviously, your, the members of your union, I know you're not speaking strictly on behalf of them, but they, they could encounter guns in a lot of ways in their solving of crimes. Um, but I imagine some of them focus specifically on trying to seize illegal guns and stop the illegal gun trade, and that obviously can be uh, very dangerous work. I know you, you lost at least two detectives to that work in the past decade, um, yeah, Nemerin and, and Andrews, I think. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how, how that work, what that work looks like, how the department approaches that, and, and what is different from that versus, say, trying to stop the flow of illegal drugs? Is it the same, same show? Sure. Um, well, um, you know, as long as there are criminals out there, and as long as there are gangs, and uh, they're running narcotics, there's, there's a market for guns, illegal guns. So there's two ways to approach it. Um, of course, the stop and frisk method, uh, and the other way is uh, uh, by doing it through undercover operations. Now, of course, um, the stop and frisk me uh, method obviously got, got way out of control. We were up at 700,000 uh, stops and frisks, and, um, and, I, and I, it was just overused, and it was deemed unconstitutional, that process, and now we're down to, I, I th I'd say, about 7,000 stops a year. So what has what has happened is that crime is down. Statistics indi indicate that crime is down and guns are down. The other way to attack it, of course, is through undercover operations. Now, the NYPD still does that. Um, I believe it's called the Gun Suppression Unit. They use confidential informants. They use undercovers. Uh, they use a lot of intelligence. And they can try and stop the flow of the illegal guns that are coming into the city. My experience, whether it was back in the 90s, or even what my, my people go through today, is that, um, you know, there was a big discussion before about the amount of permits and, and legal guns. The problem comes in, in my experience, that every time I made a gun arrest or I investigated a homicide, it was always a gun that was a stolen gun. It was never someone who had a licensed firearm who decided to go commit a crime. Part of the problem comes in is where these licensed gun owners, they do not safeguard the weapon properly, or, you know, they were the victim of a crime or their home was burglarized. So, um, but that's the way we operate. I really can't go too deeply into it and compromise, you know, you know what we're doing, but that's how we approach it. Yeah, data point for uh, just on that. Um, the uh, individual gun owners lose or get guns stolen all the time. Federally licensed firearms dealers have to report that to the ATF. Last year, 18,000 guns were reported stolen or lost across the country, and that's just the federally licensed dealers. So a lot of guns floating around. Um, when police officers make a gun arrest, I have, I have heard, I have learned that it can be difficult to make that conviction stick because there are some interesting legal issues that come up in, in terms of finding and seizing a gun. And that's something I know the administration has worked on with its gun courts. Can you talk a little bit about that effort and sort of what drives it and what kind of success you've seen? So I think, uh, you know, the approach has been, uh, especially as murders have come down and, and um, uh, to treat really every gun and every shooting, but really every gun, as if it's a murder case. And so uh, the gun violence suppression unit that, um, that Mike was talking about, um, you know, assigns a detective uh, every time a gun is found. Uh, the detective follows that gun through, develops, uh, you know, the witnesses, uh, does, you know, these days obviously DNA evidence and ballistics evidence is very important in making cases. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work that happens between uh, the police department and each DA's office, um, sort of a very daily uh, exchange of information, uh, working to make sure that the evidence uh, is good on the particular arrest. 
the gun court is something that uh, we're trying right now in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, along with the Bronx, has traditionally, uh, and to this day, had one of the highest rates of gun violence in the city. Um, and uh, their, uh, their prosecutions uh, were, uh, you know, needed help across the, bro the board. Um, and so uh, the, the gun court was a way of focusing both the prosecutor's office and, uh, and the courts on both the quality of the cases and also the speed with which they went through the system. So still a little bit early days, but um, we'll see. Could I just, because I went to a, um, a conference about cure violence where the guy, the doctor that came up with the cure violence model um, talked and he was, because you're talking about gun courts, and he was so explicit that one thing we need to do is when we think of gun violence, think disease first. So don't think crime first, think disease first. And I'm, I know it's hard for people that have to actually deal with a crime scene, but if you think, oh my gosh, this epidemic is spreading, and you think, so you're not just thinking about, oh, who did this right now today? You think about what is the environment? And from there, I just want to piggyback. You said before, these are the same neighborhoods in the 1990s. It was a neighborhood, same neighborhood today with the greatest gun violence. And we have an excellent exhibit up in our Department of Health right now about undoing the redlining, which talks about explicitly racist policies that created neighborhoods of concentrated poverty and, uh, and obviously people of color in the majority there. And there's no way to look at curing violence without thinking about a history that created that violence. So oh, I, I would love to pick up on that. Yeah. I, let me just, uh, Michael wanted to jump in. Do you want to still jump in? Or? Uh, well, I just, uh, I just wanted to say uh, about the flow of guns coming in and the violence. Um, I don't know how you feel, but I really feel, and based on uh, what the fellas uh, were saying in the in the earlier panel, you know, politics dictates everything. That's how I really feel. Uh, for instance, this Concealed um, Carry Reciprocity Act, that's uh, H.R. 38, that passed, that passed the, the House, 231 to, I believe, 179, and it's it's going to go to the Senate, and you could see the voting, that, that, that number, 231 to 179, I think that reflects just voting down party lines. It's going to go to the Senate, and, um, you know, the current makeup of the Senate, there's a good chance it's going to pass, but the thing that bothers me about it all, and that's why I say politics, is because, I don't know how you feel, but I feel, after Parkland and some of these other school shootings, the public discussion is going one way, but the politics in Washington, D.C. is going is going the other way. And I can just tell you, if this bill does pass, and it becomes law, it is going to be a law enforcement nightmare. Because, as um, I think Mr. Vance said, we get 60 million tourists a year. Well, if just 10 percent of them bring their guns with them, we're going to have a big we're going to have a big problem in the city of New York. So uh, that's my my real concern. Liz, I cut you off. Please, please go. Yeah, no, no, I, I just wanted to pick up on what you're saying because I couldn't agree more. And we sort of get into the nuts and bolts and widgets. That I don't mean to denigrate in any way, you know, the work of of law enforcement. Um, but this is really well, 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 well beyond how we prosecute or adjudicate a case. Um, and I actually think it's well, well, well beyond a public health issue. Um, we talk about that, and that's probably, you know, if I think of kind of like the three stages <laughs> of how I think we've thought about violence, you know, initially, you know, in the 90s, it was, you know, take them down, lock them up, um, incapacitate people. Um, we then passed through a stage, which I think we're in now, where we think think about it as a contagion, uh, think about the, it as a disease. But I actually think the place where we're living right now and where we must live and have to um, sort of change things in order to make sure that those top 10 neighborhoods are different, um, 
is to think about how we actually, in an affirmative way, create thriving neighborhoods, which means how do we actually create opportunities for work and play, uh, to have housing that is not dilapidated, and all of the kinds of things that create a kind of neighborhood cohesion that will, will simply make sure that violence doesn't start there. And picking up on kind of what I thought was your very moving opening, you know, violence affects kids and adults in all kinds of ways, um, and there is extremely good evidence out there that it has a very big impact on how well people do in school and whether they're able to learn. Because think about what it means to live in an environment in which simply walking to school every day you might be shot or you might not, and the level of stress and occupation of your brain with those issues, um, when you're supposed to be doing your homework or something else or paying attention in, in school, and the evidence is compelling that it does have a very big impact. So this um, intersection of violence and poverty um, is very real and the antidote to it uh, is, are all these other things, which are work, play, and a decent place to live. Let me just take this to a place that's slightly less holistic, but, but maybe a little more than we were, which is, so the city had 600, um, uh, sorry, so 57% of the city's murders last year were involved guns. Right. Um, but that means that 43% of them did not. And that's, you know, I think like 127 something murders. That's more murders than, even though it's much lower than it used to be, more murders than occurred in a year in like Australia. So it begs the question, and, and frankly the NRA would ask this question, so I feel strange asking it. You know, do we have a gun violence problem or do we have a violence problem of which guns is just maybe a particularly difficult part? Like, what, I mean, uh, what, what role do guns play in this aside from what is obviously just a general kind of violent issue? So, so one thing that's interesting about those statistics is that if you're, you were to look over the last five years uh, or a little bit longer, it used to be that in the kind of mid-60s of all our homicides were actually committed by a gun and we're now down to kind of mid Mid fifties, but yeah. What about the other half? What did it used to be? In the mid sixties, sort of hover, bouncing around the mid sixties. Um, so people are not using guns as much, and maybe it has to do with more enforcement. Maybe it has to do with neighborhood norms. Maybe it, who knows? The big question mark. Um, but yeah, I think you know. There's no question that you know frontier societies, you know, have different relationships to violence than many other places. Uh, and so, uh, I'm not an expert on that. But again, what is the antidote to violence? As a society, we have become much less violent over the last 2,000 years. You know, Stephen Pinker wrote a whole book about this, right? Um, and so, how is it that we become less violent? It is our relationship to one another uh, and how we live with one another in our neighborhoods that I think is the most sort of crucial piece of it. And can I just, I'm going to point this out again, that when we're talking about violence, we have to start with the violence that is done sometimes even by the government to the people in the neighborhood to start with. So it is violence when we create housing policies that don't allow people of color to get mortgages or we defund a neighborhood. It is impossible to talk about oh, because people do pick up guns, they pick up knives, they will beat each other up. At the Mary Mitchell Center everybody is on edge. All the kids. And here's what really upsets me is that so we, you know, we involve the young people, we have a youth council, we ask them to, we took a big busload of kids to D.C. to be part of that Parkland um, event, and they don't believe it will change, and it is not their job to fix it. 
it is our job, and especially if you are not living in a neighborhood where gun violence is every day, it's hard to remember. I know that. I grew up in a neighborhood that didn't have gun violence. Most of the time, in my mind, I'm in a place with no gun violence. But these are children afraid of being shot, and it is not their problem. Right? And you're doing a great job. And you guys are doing a great job. I believe that it is a partnership with the police department. We now, in our neighborhood, have what used to be called beat cops. They don't call them that anymore. But like two cops that just go around, and when the kids get uh, you know, in a fight, they run over there and they know them, and they call them special names. And so the police can be both um, an enforcer of the crime aftermath, but they can also help with prevention, and there's great examples of that, but it, I just really want, when we talk about violence, we have to remember that the way we're living now is the result of violence, and you have to name that, and you have to tell the kids it's not their fault. It's not your fault that you don't have a job. It is not your fault that your parents got addicted to drugs and ended up spending half their life in jail. Those were our policies. Adults made those policies. They hurt your family. They hurt you. And people need to tell them that. And all of us have to know that and believe that and talk about it at our dinner parties. We are part of it. We all have a part of the history that leads to neighborhoods where, and we're lucky that we can talk about this like just 300 for the year as opposed to in the 1990s when it was just all the time. But it, this gives us the chance right now to get past it to a place where we can talk about how we created the neighborhoods and the, and the environment, and then we have to talk about how do we remake that. So I want to go to questions very soon because we, we owe the audience some time for that, but I do want to, if we can, quickly talk about two policy issues. Um, Michael, I know this is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a softball to hit here, but I know that you've raised the, the issue of detective resources and whether they are sufficient in the different commands. And you know we've been talking about how m murders being and violence being down so low, but still what remains concentrated in some neighborhoods. I guess that makes the political um, political push for more detective resources a harder sell. But uh, has that improved at all in terms of uh, you know getting enough people to when there is violence find out where the gun came from and, and try to put a stop to it from that end? Well, um, as you mentioned, we uh, we have have quite a few units, the, the, the most important one, the gun suppression unit, and some of these other units that we do have work along with federal authorities. For instance, the gun suppression unit works hand in hand with the ATF. To, uh, so when a gun does come into our possession, uh, you know, we can track it, see where it came from, where it's been used before. Uh, we can also, uh, working along with the ATF, monitor the traffic, the overall traffic of the uh, the guns, if that's what you're speaking about. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question that's, completely. That's fine, yeah. yeah. Um, so Heidi, we referred to cure violence a few times, but can you talk um, about what that looks like in in your neighborhood and the, the pilot program that's occurring there. What exactly does it mean day to day? Um, actually, these are your programs, so you're going to do a better job than I do. But well, Heidi we, first. Okay, that. so um, actually, I'll we. Be the bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> um, right now, we just, the mayor announced in October that they're expanding cure violence into the 52nd precinct, which is where I live, and the 48th where I work. And so we're just planning right now, but we have a partner organization. So what happens is, in our case, let's just, it, the Mary Mitchell Center, we will partner with uh, um, Good Shepherd, and they find people from the neighborhood who have been involved in the violence around what these are really apartment building to apartment building conflict and sometimes generational. So the people in Twin Park South and the people in Twin Parks North cannot abide each other and they will fight and sometimes they will shoot at each other. That's mostly the kind of violence but there are adults who grew up in that who know what's going on and uh, um, they get hired to go back in there and you have to be a credible messenger so people have to trust you. So while they, um, they don't part 
partner with the police. They're set up in precincts, but they don't partner with the police. Like they're not going to go tell the police, oh, so and so might choose so and so. And they, but they talk to the people and they help them to um, reduce the violence in the neighborhood and then they help to connect them to the services that they need, them personally, one at a time, people. Not like, oh, for the whole neighborhood. Like we have a great after school program. We hope that it keeps kids off the street. We're talking about you got shot, we're going to talk to you and your family, just like if you were contagious the people that you know, and then you provide them with support services. So we are super excited to be partnering with them on providing those support services. Just want to talk quickly about, um, is, that, is one, that a citywide? Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was asking about that. Exactly. Time. Please, talk, Liz. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, exactly. I, and it's in uh, now 19 neighborhoods in New York City that account for over 50% of the shootings. Um, and it's both the credible messengers who sort of anticipate, know, know the neighborhood well enough to anticipate violence before it starts. Uh, the program is headed up in my office by, uh, we have an office to prevent gun violence uh, by a man named Eric Cumberbatch. Um, and he works with multiple, multiple, about 60 different organizations across the, the city. And actually John D Jay did a evaluation of this um, and showed, essentially compared the neighborhoods that had cure violence to other neighborhoods that looked very similar to them. And they had about four times the reduction in shootings as the comparison neighborhoods. And the other two things that I thought were really interesting from the study that John Jay did is one, um, confidence in the police went up. The notion that last year I would have never called the police, this year I might have thought about it. Um, and second, a kind of denormalization of violence. Last year I would have shot the guy, this year maybe not. That's good news. Um, so we have a little bit of time for questions. They have to just be questions. I'm even going to hold the microphone like a real jerk. Thank you. Uh, question for the panel. Uh, I'm sure you saw a few days ago the May Comstat uh, statistics. Uh, it showed that uh, there was a substantial increase in the number of homicides in New York City in May compared to May 2007, 2017, and also a substantial increase in the number of shootings uh, May 2018 to, compared to May 2017. Um, please share with us uh, your theories as to why there was a, a substantial increase in the number of homicides sites and shootings. So I don't have a good theory for that. I would say that we're still doing pretty well. Obviously, you know, we watch that with great anticipation. Um, you know, every shooting and any murder is one too many. Um, but we'll see, uh, you know, and hope to be able to, uh, to get back on track for the summer. I don't have an answer to that, but I'll tell you what does cause spikes of violence in our neighborhood, and that is when people get out of jail who had been like involved in criminal activity, and really just a corner, right? So they used to sell drugs on this corner, and somebody took their place, but they want their corner back, and I don't know that that would necessarily explain that, but that is one reason why we get um, spikes in violent crime, because there's conflict over um, territory. All right, I have a question here. Uh, um, uh, I'd like, uh, no, sorry, I want to go to someone else just because we have very little time. Yeah, hi, this is a question for Detective Palladino. Um, in your position as a lobbyist, and then also given uh, some of the comments from the last uh, panel and the importance of the patrolman's positions in moving public opinion, uh, what is, you said, I believe you said that you hadn't, um, you didn't know what the general patrolman's positions would be, but what are their positions, if possible, and isn't it important to find out, uh, on uh, the various laws in New York State that are being trying to put through for gun control, and then also nationally? Well, as I said, uh, I haven't really polled uh, my membership at all with respect to uh, their feeling on the on the gun control laws. So I really I can't uh, really answer you, uh, that question to you. And don't forget, you see, I'm I'm not police management. Uh, I'm concerned about you know um, representing my members, wages, hours, working conditions. So the the um, the pieces of legislation that my members are very familiar with are the ones uh, that um, that 
that their best interests are in. Uh, so that's what I focus on more with my members, uh, more than the gun control laws. So I, that's why I haven't polled them on that. Question right here. I can, yeah. Um, I'm, I, I was late, so <clears throat> please excuse me. <clears throat> but I wanted to know um, if this was already covered, like I said, excuse me. Is there a universal definition that you guys have of violence in order to attack this problem from these different agencies? No, I don't think that there is. I think it depends on probably the police department has a very, like they even sometimes with the data that they collect, we often like to point out that they collect data on people that actually get hit by bullets, but you can't really, it's hard to collect data on shootings, but the shootings in a neighborhood can create, even though they don't hit anybody, can create a real sense of um, anxiety. So there's a lot of, um, there's not an easy way to just collect data on like what you would, we would all agree something like a gunshot is violence. And then, but then like from our perspective as a community center, as I said before, we think of historical violence, but agencies may, the public health perspective would look more at our, is public health changing? So my guess, I, not from my perspective, is there any like agreed upon? I don't think there's a universal definition. Uh, what the police department does based on the penal law, which uh, you know explains all the different crimes, I think the department will focus more on murders, rapes, robberies, robberies with a, a deadly weapon, assaults, uh, and stuff like that. That's how um, anytime someone is hit or injured, I think that's that's their you know definition of violence. Hi, my name is Evan. I'm a public school teacher here in the city for 15 years. And my question is kind of filtered through that lens and also based on some of the things you said about holistically approaching the problem, building community, and also the fact that the public sector has been defunded is something that was addressed up there. And I think these are all crucial pieces of the puzzle. Based on all that, my question is, is there a possibility or is there any conclusive data that the privatization of schools and charters has encroached upon the public sector in such a way to denigrate our ability to build community where gun violence is a problem? And can you speak to that at all? No. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. I just don't know the answer to that. Oh, well, hello. My name's Kyle Roberts. Um, so mine's more of a comparative question. <clears throat> So there's, inje there's injection sites around New York City, or at least they're creating injection sites. And uh, the argument is that when you give people the opportunity to, you know, do what they do, but you provide them services directly outside of that, it helps promote a culture of understanding and um, of resiliency that people would no longer want to do drugs. Uh, there's a common narrative that states that when you give a city or state a lot of guns, that violence inherently goes down because everyone has a gun and then everyone would just start fighting each other. Um, what is the inherent issue or problem with, with that comparison in terms of allowing people to do drugs, which will help them get rid of it, and allowing people to have guns, which would help them get rid of it? Okay, I'm not quite sure I'm understanding the question, and I think to the extent I understand it, I maybe completely reject both premises. So um, I, I think that actually the evidence is, um, and I think this is what the panel before this was saying, was that um, states with lax gun laws actually have more shootings, not fewer. Um, and I think the issue with respect to safe injection sites, um, and New York City does not have safe injection sites, but there's a proposal now to, if certain hurdles are, um, are overcome, to potentially have a, a test. Um, but the idea with safe injection sites is really, as the name suggests, is that for people who may be uh, using drugs in any case, that it may be better to be in a place where if something bad happens, if they overdose, that they have um, help there 
uh, as quickly as they can. But I don't think that the concept is um, that safe injection sites by themselves will necessarily reduce drug trafficking. We have time for I, one I, more question. Could I just take a stab at that? Oh, sorry, yes, go right ahead. Answer to, um, I will tell you, I, um, I don't understand why politicians want to lower the behavioral bar in some instances. For instance, I don't believe in decriminalizing some behavior. Um, you know, bringing the bar down to the, to the behavior instead of the behavior coming up to the bar. So that's my position on that. The other thing I will tell you is what an interesting experience I had. I was in the state of Texas and I was in someone's car. And we know the, the gun laws in Texas are quite relaxed. And as I was getting out of the car, I noticed that the person that I was with, uh, or was a relative, had a, a, a gun in a holster underneath the seat. Now, from where I come from in the NYPD, oh God, like that, they bury you for um, failure to safeguard your weapon, and rightfully so. And um, closed the door, locked it, and walked away. And so I said, you know, you have a 30, uh, was that a 38 I saw under your seat? Yeah. Well, how do you just leave a gun? Lo is it loaded? Yeah. Well, how do you just leave a gun loaded? Hey, you know what he said? He said, Mike, everyone down here has guns. You think they're going to break into the car and take mine? So that's the mentality. Uh, I don't know if it's a good mentality. It's certainly different than mine, but in the state of Texas where people are walking around with them concealed and I think they just passed a law down there that if you want to, you can wear it exposed. It's a whole different, whole different mentality. I don't know if, I don't have the answer, but I just figured I'd so, share that experience. So now with we you. just, just, I was just shocked. Real quick, real quick. One yeah. more, just... Kids are far more likely to kill themselves if you have a gun in your house. So that may be true, you know, everyone can have a gun, but remember that for child safety, it is just 100% better not for everyone to have a gun. So on that note, we have come to full time, so I want to ask you to thank this panel, not only the great panelists, but in their way, different ways they work to stop violence each day. And thank you very much for coming. Thanks to Stephen and the folks at the center for helping us set this up, and have a good evening. I'm so glad to meet you. I have been so.